it's just seven o'clock and I think um, we've got a, a fair number of people here already. So I think we will get started. I'm Genevieve Lemoyne. I'm the curator of the Perry McMillan Arctic Museum here at Bowdoin College. And I'm thrilled to have Rhea Banker here for a talk. Um, I want to begin first with a very brief land acknowledgement. I'm speaking to you from the museum, from my office at the museum at Bowdoin College here in Brunswick, Maine, which is part of the traditional homeland of the Wabanaki, the people of the Dawnland, who are today comprised of the Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot peoples. And we are grateful to them um, for their care of this land. Um, also, before we get started, just a little bit of business. I have mentioned you're all muted and we can't see you. So we can't see you or hear you. Um, you can ask questions in the chat. Um, and we will certainly have time for questions after the talk. So I encourage you to type them in as you think of them during the talk or afterwards, if you prefer that. And um, we'll, be, we'll either read them out or if I can figure it out, I think I can allow you just ask them yourselves. Um, and also this talk is being recorded. Uh, and will be available on our website um, in a week or two because it takes time for the captioning to get finalized, but it will be available. So if you have friends or colleagues who can't be here tonight and wish they could be, they will have an opportunity to see it later. So tonight we're here to celebrate the opening of our newest virtual exhibit, Kamutit Greenland Sled Portraits by photographer Ria Banker. Almost exactly one year ago, we were in the middle of preparing a physical version of this exhibit to be installed in our photography exhibit space in the foyer of Hubbard Hall. Sadly, that was not to be. And as we approached the one year mark with no firm date for reopening the museum to the public, we decided that a virtual exhibit would be worth exploring. So I emailed Ria and we spoke and luckily for all of us, she agreed. And so here we are. The exhibit is live on our webpage now, and if you haven't looked at it already, I encourage you to spend some time with it, appreciating the beauty of these amazing images. I know that after hearing Rhea speak about it, about the exhibit and about her experiences creating these photographs, you'll have a deeper appreciation for dog sleds, for the landscapes that they are used in, and for the people who use them. In some ways, dog sleds are a bit of a departure for Ria. Her photography over the last two decades or more has focused on amazing details of the landscape, remarkable, almost abstract portraits of geological features that speak to deep time, to a sense of place, and as she puts it, to the untold stories of history. Her work has been exhibited widely from New York to Buenos Aires, in Edinburgh, Scotland, Stornoway, Inverness, a number of places in other places in Scotland, in Copenhagen, and in a series of museums in Greenland. Uh, and now in Brunswick, Maine, we're happy to say. She's traveled and photographed extensively in Greenland over the last five years. And I'm not gonna talk to you about that because she can talk much more eloquently about it. And so without further ado, I will turn things over to her to tell you more about her time in Greenland and her amazing understanding and appreciation for dog sleds. Thank so. you so much, Jenny. I'm going to share my screen. Yes. So can... Okay. I'm hoping everybody can see the screen. I can see it. So, um, hi, everybody. I'm so glad that you're both here tonight. Um, I wish I could say it's good to see you, but we know I can't. So I'll just try to feel your presence at, the, at this presentation. Um, in whatever time zone you're in, whatever state you're in, thank you so much for being here. Um, I truly wish to thank the Perry McMillan Museum, um, especially, of course, Susan Kaplan and Jenny Lemoyne for making both the exhibit and this talk possible during these really difficult times. I truly wish we were meeting in person um, along with a cafe meek. And a cafe meek in Greenland is when people come together for socializing, for company, for um, sharing landmarks through their lives. Um, and there's always a lot of food. 
So I'll try to keep the spirit of this presentation as the cafe meek without food. All right, so thank you very much for being here. Um, first, I wanted to share something that I read quite some time ago. It's, a, it's something short, but um, I think it gives a lot of information and gives you an entry point um, into my work and along my journeys. Nud Rasmussen, maybe some of you know of him. He was born in 1879 in Greenland, actually, um, in Ilulisat. And he had an Inuit mother and a Danish father. And as he grew up, he, his life was based on exploring the Arctic, particularly Greenland. Um, he traveled all over. He also went through the Northwest Passage by Kamutit. Um, and with all of his, he was an explorer, but he was also an ethnologist. And the biggest gift I feel he gave, at least the way I feel, is he would meet with the Inuit elders in every settlement that he traveled through. He got to know the people in their communities and they would share their stories with him, um, folklore, songs, and Rasmussen wrote all of these things down in his journals. And that is available for all of us to read, um, which I think is a very special gift. Um, as he was writing these things down, um, he learned his, a great deal, of course, about the culture. But he met with this woman, this was, I think, on his third excursion, the Tula expedition, I think it was his third trip. And he met um, a local elder, her name was Simiga. Um, when Inuits share stories or magic words or lessons, it's something that's passed from individual to individual unless a shaman has, has a circle and he's talking to the whole group, but they really felt words were magical. And if some magic word was given to a, a younger person, those words stayed with that person until they died. So words have a tremendous power um, for the Inuits. So this is, the, um, this is what she whispered to him. She also said, by the way, that on a long journey, it is wise to be on good terms with the spirit of mountains and chasms. And I think for any of you who traveled in the outdoors, you know, it certainly is a good idea to be on good terms. Um, I wish the whole world would learn that um, when you look at all the ecological problems we have now, but those are very wise words from Simiga. She wanted to share with him, I would call it a magic song, and this is one of them. It's a song of life for whoever wants to fully live. The day stirs from its sleep. The day breaks with the dawning light. You too must stir. You too must fully awake with the breaking day. I feel this means a lot to me in that it's about sharing a life of awareness, whether it's the awareness of your environment, awareness of your community, awareness of the nature around you in each day each detail, each color, each line. Um, in doing this, and in, in part of my work, I've traveled to many far edges of the earth in order to see where I can find the stories in the land. Some of these edges, um, I've, I'm showing you three examples here. Um, I work, I use photography as a basis, um, but I work very much like an anthropologist, an archeologist, a paleontologist, just like scientists, I go out into the field, I look for my relics, my artifacts, my specimens, and I bring them back to my studio, my lab, um, and uh, start my searching of the truths that I can find when I return. From the time that I learned that the surface of the earth moved, that the continents came together and split apart and are still doing so, um, I was driven to find visible evidence of where the earth's been and where it is now and possibly where it's headed. I've experienced climate change by seeing the receding glaciers, um, by seeing the collapse of mountains, um, but I've also witnessed the beautiful recycling of earth's building blocks. I'm going to share some of that work now. As Jenny said, um, most of my work, much of my work, is done on an abstract style. Um, but with all landscapes, they share certain qualities. Um, we are moved by lights, by shapes, 
um, by lines, by textures. Um, and that's what I try to grasp in the abstract pieces. This image here is from the Svalbard archipelago. It's about 10 degrees south of the North Pole, um, 70 degrees, close to 80, you reach the, close to the 80th degree line. Um, I was there for an artist residency last year, and this image is from Svalbard. This may be from an island, maybe some of you have been to, it's the island of Bernra off the west coast of Scotland, which is part of the Outer Hebrides. The Outer Hebrides it, it is so incredible in terms of really offering a mixture of elements, the wind, the sea, the stone. Scotland has some of the oldest stone on earth, as does Greenland. Um, they both have the ancient gneiss, G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, ancient granites, and um, share this, the oldest landscape textures on earth. And this last one, this one is actually from Greenland. This is from Ululasat, as I mentioned before. And the gift of Greenland and Ululasat in particular is the gift of ice meeting stone, stone meeting sea, sea meeting the air. So the interaction between ice and the rocks themselves, the carving of it, the pushing of it, um, the colors, particularly the colors, um, something unique to Greenland. So the Kamatit, so this is a different kind of landscape that I'll be sharing today. However, it shares many of the same elements that the land offers. And um, what makes this kind of story important to me is that not only do I respond to the land itself um, and what's going on beneath the crust, or between rocks or underneath rocks. Or, um, I also am inspired by the cultural connections that I feel to these places. Um, the people that I meet are a critical part of the story. I form friendships with people um, that have been as important to me as any piece of art I, I've ever made. <laughs> um, I'm aware of the cultural connection in everything I see, in the language that I hear spoken, be it Greenlandic language or the Gaelic language, um, songs, stories I hear, um, even um, in the sound of the raven's cry uh, when they circle overhead, in Numina, they circle overhead. And uh, I felt they were always company to me in my journeys in Greenland. I'm still focusing on texture and light, as you'll see, shapes and contrasts that I try to show in my abstract work, you'll see here as well. I'm trying to express a certain kind of energy, whether that's the energy of the land or the people or the past, present or future, that's what I'm trying to capture. In this case, I am moved by all of the visual qualities of the scenes, but it's the particular layers of story um, that, that I want to share. Um, these elements can be of time passing, uh, disappearing traditions, uh, lost stories, a life in transition, um, and the community impact of it all. First, I'd like to share a little bit about the history of the Kamatif, the sledge. Um, they, there's evidence of dog sledding it goes back 4,000 years. It's believed um, the tradition came across Siberia, north of Siberia, across the north of Alaska, all the way through Canada and arrived in Greenland um, probably around, it's about a thousand years ago is what is believed. Um, the diagram, well, I really wanted to share this diagram on the left because I just love it. Um, it comes from 1819. It was from a book that Captain John Ross wrote, A Voyage of Discovery. Um, and if you look closely at it, it has all of the elements that you see in, in all the sleds today. Um, historic sleds and current sleds and um, you see the same beautiful weaving of the sinews um, on the sled that holds all the pieces together. Traveling across the ice is very tricky, very dangerous. And if you put the sleds together with nails, the sled will be too stiff to handle the bumps along the way. So this truly makes the Kamatit um, totally responsive to the land it meets as it travels. Um, and on the right, a 20th century picture um, oh, this is actually of Umanak. Uh, um, this is of Umanak. And you can see in the lower right hand corner, you can see the Kamatit layered up 
um, on racks. And it's a picture that, that you'll see today as well. And you will see such a picture. This gives you an example of traveling across the ice. Um, there's so many elements that are so risky. The visibility, um, the textures, the ice not melting, holes in the ice, crevasses. But it's the only way that people could travel during the winter um, to fellow communities, to see families, different people. Um, it's really the only way to go. And today, well, I'll hold that till later, but this is where it's like crossing the ice. Okay, the Kamata also played a big role in polar explora expo exploration. Um, many of the polar explorers made use of them, some to uh, some with success and some with very sad failures. But I want to focus on this one. This is Alfred Wegener. Um, he was a scientist, a meteorologist. Um, he was the first man to come up with the, the concept of continental drift. So he's definitely one of my big heroes. Um, anyway, so he was doing some polar air experiments on the ice cap of Greenland. Um, and you can see here, that he, he was not that successful with the dogs and they not, everyone wasn't necessarily. Um, but look at the, how he's using the, the sails on the commentary. That's pretty, pretty amazing. And on the right, you can see these are the crevasses that if you were to hike up Greenland, the coast of Greenland, to try to get on the ice cap, certain areas you're blocked by walls that look just like this. So you have to carry, sometimes you have to carry dogs. You have to carry the sleds and the dog um, to get up to the ice cap itself. But these sleds were used by um, Amundsen, Peary, Shackleton, Nansen, and Scott with um, the sad result for Scott. Now, if you're lucky enough um, to be in the Bowdoin community, to be in Maine, um, the, the museum has its own sledge. Um, and this is the Hubbard sledge, and it is a, really a beauty. It's really a beauty. Um, it was built in 1908. Um, and it's one of the five comets that went with Peary in his search for the North Pole. Um, it's said that he designed it, and I believe Matthew Henson built it. Um, but look at it. I mean, it's the sweep of the curves, the, the warmth of the textures, um, the wear on the slats, and how it's tied together. It's, it's really a beautiful thing to see. And think of the stories that this sled holds. That's quite exciting stories. I also want to include these two. Um, they're also from his, his experiences. The left, you're on top of the ice cap, so you can see featureless. Imagine navigating with the sleds and the dogs over a featureless landscape. But the right, I just, I, I, this is the first time I'm seeing them were on the right. It's all the dogs he had on, on, on the boat that he brought along with him. It's, it's pretty amazing. Okay, as to the landscape, as to the site itself, where I, I pursued this project, this is the island of Umanok. It's a, the island off the west coast of Greenland, and I'll show you where it is. The population is only about 1,400 people, um, and yet it's the eighth largest town in Greenland. That, that tells you something. Um, but the mountain looms into the sky every day, um, catching the sun in different light, revealing its secrets of geology, and uh, being a presence for the people who live there. Here's a map, you can see if you look at the map on the left, it's the whole of Greenland, um, which is mostly covered by an ice cap. But if you look just below the word Greenland, you can see the word Umanak, and Umanak means um, the heart-shaped mountain, which is what it is, the heart-shaped mountain. Um, on the right, um, you can see the Umanak, you see a big red dot towards the bottom of it. And it, it's so amazing. I, I wanted you to be aware of the situation of this island and its people um, and its traditions because it is so, how do I say, embraced by the land around it. Um, you're so aware of the peninsula, the Nuswa Peninsula is beautiful. Um, there are islands scattered all over floating in the water. That's how it feels. 
And in the distance, you see the ice cap. Um, so the island itself is part of the larger life of Greenland in a topographical way. Bread in the rock, bread in the rock. Here's a picture of actually within the village and um, at its core, you see the heart-shaped mountain just peeking on top of the clouds. Um, the Inuits believe that there's no such thing as animate and inanimate. Everything has a spirit. So whether you know it's a rock or the sea or, or a mountain, they're all filled with spirits. And I have to say, spending time in the presence of this mountain, the spirit does penetrate you powerfully. A little bit about the geology. This is what first drew me to the island. Um, it, 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 it's ancient and you feel its age and its wear and its feelings of tumble, of cracking, of splitting. Um, everything you see is coming apart um, with the wear of age, with the wear of the glaciers, um, the wind. Um, the two sides, I'm showing two sides of the island here. One side, it's very filled with these kind of pink granites and the Louisian nice stripes of the quartz. The other side, you're much more aware of the actual spilling of the island into the sea, um, but filled with movement, movement everywhere. In the silence, you, you, you definitely feel the movement. I'm sharing this, <laughs> this unbeknownst to me, this was my first portrait of a commentator. If you look at the very bottom, where I've circled it in red, that, there's a sled sitting there right on the harbor in the midst of the boats um, that the fishermen use. So uh, you get an idea of the scale of the mountain to the town, of course, but um, there's, there's the first commentator. Um, the formal aspects of landscape, as we, we were talking, um, it gives one pleasure just in seeing the colors and the shapes. and that's what I call the formal, the angles, the formal aspects that give pleasure. Um, but in this particular project, I'm focusing on what I call the narrative aspects of landscape, um, which the content of what I'm shooting um, tells the story beyond the, the actual appearance of um, what this thing is. So, um, and the stories that we, that we will see are stories of um, that affect the people's lives um, that affects the changes in the economy and ultimately affects political change as well. Okay, the portraits themselves. Um, I did, I've done work in black and white and in color, which I'll share both of them with you. Um, and sometimes I focus on the detail, which is of course the beautiful linear work of these ropes. Um, and sometimes on, I, I step back um, to see more of the scene. Um, but even in the ropes, the tying of the ropes, I'm just so aware, sensitively acute to the, to the hand that wrapped those ropes. Um, okay. I started um, very up close to the, towards the, the, where the mountain hits the island, way up. Um, and the sleds that I found there um, are truly embraced by the earth around them. As you can see, the, even though you just see a part of the commenter here, the curves of the runners are so in harmony with the curves of the stone, the quartzite seams that go wrap around that boulder. Um, I, you don't really can separate the subject from the environment, the harmonious blend. Sometimes I did do black and white. Um, usually to stress the uh, feeling of isolation. Um, not only are many of these sleds isolated in how they left off season up in the hills, um, but there's a certain isolation to the communities themselves. Um, travel, as I said, between them is, is very limited. Um, very few villages, cities in Greenland have airports, for example. So yes, there's air travel um, to the major places, um, but these other places, you either have to go by small plane, if you, um, helicopters. Um, helicopters do quite a bit of travel between communities and aid in any kind of medical emergencies um, or by boats. 
but um, the isolation of the sleds, the isolation of where you are, they share that same feeling. Okay, this is an interesting one in that in the winter time, when fishermen go out onto the ice, sometimes they stay for days at a time. So they build these little huts that, as you can see, sitting right on the runners. Um, but it's the beauty of the grain of that wood with the grain of the boulders that struck me. The grays of the light, the horizon. That's, this is the story of the, of the fishing sludge. Okay, the, um, sometimes I, I've seen images that have what I call foreign objects, okay? The introduction of a bigger story than, than what I'm seeing here, either about what is that? Who owns this? Why is it here? Um, what are the hidden things that I, I will never know? Um, it gives some clues as to the, as to the age sometimes of the sleds, um, clues to the identity. Um, it's like, I often find rocks that I would say, what is this rock? I, I would like to, I wanna know what it is. And I'll take it to a friend who's a geologist. And the first question, I get this all the time is, okay, Ria, but where was the rock found? Where was it? What was next to it? What was on the other side of it? What was around it? What was the climate like? What, you know, so it's the context helping understand um, the identity. So I feel that way about the sledges too. Um, I have found something very special and uh, which is filled with the story of the things around it. You know, I'm just trying to show the shared elements of decay, whether it's found with um, something from modern day, which is also decaying, it leaves one feeling that something is at risk. The way of life is at risk environment is at risk and um, the objects share that feeling. And that feeling of isolation again, this led pretty far up in the mountain. Um, and even the, the, the rag that's been used um, adds to the textural context of the image. Someone's used it and uh, okay, color. When color comes into the picture, and it plays a big part of the story, um, you're always surrounded by you know, the beautiful reds of the granites um, that, that fall back into the, into the distance. Um, but here you see a beautiful blue, which is used, um, one of many colors used on common tip. But the other thing that draws me here is when you see them stacked, the large, the medium, the small one, it, 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 it creates a sense of rhythm, to, much like music where you have the main theme and then you have a second theme come in and then a third theme. Um, there's a rhythm to the sledges when you see them together in groups. And um, I think this is a good example. Once in the village of Umina, um, the houses are built on these steep hills, you know, on these cliffs. And a lot of them um, have these wonderful, huge, long staircases that you have to climb to get to them. But sometimes the staircases are broken. Sometimes the house that was at the top is gone. And it's just as precarious as the commutate itself, precariously positioned on this boulder. Um, it, you get a feeling of the, how special and fleeting things can be. The picture on the right, I love this one because it's like a snapshot of everything. You've got the mountain, you've got one of the little houses, um, you've got the sled in dry dock, um, and the rust. There's a lot of rust, um, old oil cans, old machines um, that add to the palette of the scene. This one, um, this one reminds me, this is like my Hubbard sledge of Umanak. It's very large. Um, but the way it beautifully frames the, the, this particular community um, that sweeps out into the fog, um, very silent, um, very quiet, and has a certain majesty perched over the whole thing.
there are also children's kamatit, which are very sweet, um, painted beautiful colors, bright colors. But you can even see here, it's that complex conversation, visual conversation of the sled that's peeling, um, the broken bicycles, old rubber tires, and uh, oil drums, of course, um, against this beautifully painted pink house. Um, I just wanted to show you the complexity of what you can be seeing around every corner. This is what I call the tipping point portraits. And they're the most moving in, in many ways. Um, because here you see the combination of um, modern life coming into the community, the boat, the boat engine, um, which is also collapsed, um, sitting on top of the sledge. There's spectacular challenges um, of, com of commercial development in these settlements and in these villages. Um, recycling is, is a huge challenge. Um, there's no way to really get rid of some of the garbage, um, especially in the remote settlements. Um, and this is something that will have to be dealt with. So here, of course, the, the Arctic cats, it made such a big difference in the lives of Greenlanders, uh, especially up in the North. Um, and are rightfully taking over the role of the sledge. Um, and the, actually, it's, it's an interesting situation because travel by sledge is, is quiet. I mean, you hear the whoosh across the ice, the whooshing of the sledge, the whooshing of the sledge, and it gets replaced by the cacophonous sounds of these snow cats. So um, even the, the hearing environment is changing. The sound environment is changing as the visual environment is changing. Here, relics, relics of a lifestyle intermixed with the refuse of another, one lifestyle with another. I mean, that's a modern architecture and it's just as much a relic. Um, revealing the passage of time just as much as the sledges that are tossed on the gravel pit. Speaking of the environment and uh, the warming temperatures, a lot of people are working up in Greenland now to see the, the Arctic area is the fastest warming area on earth right now. And um, here's an example I wanted to share. There's a big tradition of racing, dog racing in Greenland. And this is a picture actually in Umanok uh, where the men, the drivers get together, race, compete with each other for the glory of their of their town. Um, but then the winners of these races go to, onto a larger race with other settlements, other communities. It's a big time for people to get together. This year is the first year that the village of Umanok could not compete in the larger races because the fjord itself never froze long enough or deep enough or consistently enough to really practice and safely on the ice. You know, it's a very intimate example of the change of life. As I got very involved with these, the mixture of elements of the sled and the land and the place, um, I went to purely black and white studies um, and these tend towards the abstract side, but um, I just felt so strongly that the stories of the sled in the landscape and um, this is Tarak in the shadow of the mountain. And I wanted to use tones and textures to express that intermixing. Here's one um, where you can see the runners, part of the boulders next to the coast. I tried to use lights and darks to express the drama of a situation. And that could be the visual drama, the social drama, the economic drama, environmental drama. And finally, this study was done to really show that it's the island and the traditions are one. They are shared, they are intertwined, and they are one. 
critical to my practice is not just creating the artwork, but is giving back to the places I've been, to the people that I've met who have supported me, um, to the friends that I've made along the way. Um, it's critical for me. So um, I've shown at local museums, small little history museums, old fish factories, um, libraries. Um, these are the sharing points um, that have meant the most to me. Um, this place, Nutakak, is a wonderful small museum in Nook, which is the capital of Greenland. Uh, it's not the art museum, there's a big art museum and there's a history museum, which is wonderful. Um, but this is more of a community place where um, the community comes together for all kinds of programs. Um, they can be cultural programs, um, musicians play there, um, and uh, movies are shown there. So um, I contacted the Newtokok, um, people from Newtokok Museum, and we came up with, I think, was a pretty exciting idea. I'll show you. Okay, so I really want to work with the children. I worked with children in Umana too, but um, that was a different project. Here, we wanted the children to be able to make their own kamute. Um, it's very important to the Greenlanders that traditions, even if they're struggling to survive, that the history is passed on to the children. Um, that includes music, drum dancing, the old ways. And here you can see a family of my artworks in the background. Um, I created some books for them, posters. Usually grandchildren working with their grandparents. Um, I was supposed to be there, but thanks to COVID, um, I was only able to see pictures and talk to people on the phone at the museum who were just wonderful, wonderful. And I love this one. You can see we use popsicle sticks, popsicle sticks to build these and um, traditional commentary on the base of the commentary on the, on the boards, they do lay skins. So, uh, and they're usually seal skins. And here you see a very happy boy who actually has the seal skin on his sledge. Um, and look how it's tied. It's, it's even tied in the traditional way, which is wonderful. Um, but the dogs, the dogs are his idea. So they're wonderful too. Um, I've also done this in the south of Greenland um, at the Narsok Museum. The south of Greenland is quite different from the north in that um, it's got greenery. Um, food is grown there and um, it's warmer. Um, and I, I'm showing you the map just so you can get an idea of how Greenland is quite large. If you put Greenland on top of Europe, it would cover all of Europe, just to give you an idea of the size of Greenland. Um, there's Narsok in the middle. And 821 uh, was an old fish factory, which was turned into a, a community hall, places for people to come, also always with food. <laughs> So I made sure to have food there. Um, and uh, the inside of this museum was really interesting. Here's some of the exhibit, once again, posters and books for them. But some of these small historical museums, they also have a lot of artifacts, um, clothing, uh, toys, um, weapons, I mean, tools like uh, harpoons, um, oars, um, kayaks. So um, mixing the imagery with these artifacts was very special for me. And I'm very grateful um, to the people at the museum for allowing me to do this. So with that, I, once again, I wanna thank you all for being here. It's really great to see you. Um, I'll say this is the, actually the first comment I, I saw in Umanak, it's about this big. And it's in one of the small local museums. And I thought there's something pretty special and magical in that. And there certainly is. So Kuyanak, thank you very much. And um, I'd like to take questions. I'm hoping Jenny will moderate this. Yes, I will moderate. Um, so yes, we have started to get some questions in. Um, thank you, Ria. It was really wonderful to see that broad range of, of images and to, to hear you talk about them. I really like how, even though there's no actual people in the photographs, you know that they're there. That it's, it, it is kind of archeological in that sense in that the, the landscape looks bleak and barren and yet it's an occupied landscape and there are, there are people behind it, which is 
I, I really appreciate that. Um, but we do have questions, so I'm going to, I'll try and make it, oh, oh, oh I'm clicking the wrong button, that would explain it. Okay, um, I'll try and ask them kind of in the order that they appear just so, um, uh, just to keep some kind of order to things. Um, so Joanna has said first, such lovely work. Um, and she asks, do you ever take photos at the same location at different time periods or time of day, I guess? Um, I definitely shoot at different times of day. Um, in terms of times of year, you probably laugh at this, but in the summer in Greenland, there are horrible mosquitoes. <laughs> mosquitoes, mosquitoes, terrible. So I only go in the spring and the fall. So I have done um, shooting in the spring and the fall in the South has gorgeous colors, the lichens, the small Arctic growth. The colors are beautiful. People say, you know, Greenland's white it is not white. Okay, and then Alex Platt has asked, um, have the Arctic cats, snow machines, taken over entirely? Is there any use of the comatites? Um, and if so, where are the dogs? Yes, yes. Okay. So, um, no, it is the, the, the uh, machines have not fully taken over at all. Um, their sleds are used um, in the north, um, but they're being used more for tourists now, really. Um, but I do see fishermen go out in with them, and uh, the men do race, but they're still there. The dogs it's funny, these are only used north of the Arctic Circle. These sleds and dogs are not used in the south. Um, and the dogs are there, I just did not take pictures of the dogs. And if I can add, as you go, and I think there's a law north, further north than Umanak, but north of Melville Bay, so Kanak, Thule area, um, they, have their own local restrictions on the use of snowmobiles. And so the hunters there do continue to use dog sleds. They don't, most of them, I think the hospital and the store are the only snowmobiles in those communities. That makes sense. Uh, so there's, you know, a more active use of sleds there. And that's a very conscious decision on their part. Um, and Alex, just continuing in order, he also asked, how are their lives changing as a result of climate change? You referred a little bit to some of those changes. Do you want to elaborate? Yes, it's really with the with the coming of, well, there's tremendous concern about collapsing of coastlines there. Um, there have been quite a few landslides and what happens is, and this happened once when I was there, uh, there'll be a landslide on one of the peninsulas that may not be populated and it will cause a tsunami. Yeah. And, uh, a whole village was washed away when I was there. So I would say it's the collapsing um, and the rising waters, but the most immediate effect right now environmentally has to do with the collapsing of landscapes and the commercialization um, affecting the disappearing culture. You know, everybody has their color TV, everybody has, you know, a phone, well, not everybody, but the TV, the phone, um, and uh, there are some serious social problems in the communities, um, alcoholism. And uh, because these people who are losing their traditions and their heritage, what do you replace that with? It's, it can be devastating to these communities. Um, so let's see, oh, this is a question that you'll have to answer definitely, Ria, because I can't answer it. I hope Gina. I can. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can. Maybe you didn't even notice. Um, Gina has asked, what is over the stairway in the the stair going up above to the museum in Nuuk, the, the local museum, the Nuuk Museum? It looked like the remnants of an awning or something. You might need to look back. At I it. don't know. I would have to take a look at it. Yeah. I, I was kind of wondering that. Right. <laughs> Hang on. What's at the top of it? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's an awning. It is awning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But now, yeah, I have to get back to this. Yes, it is an awning. It is. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Just in case, if, you know, when the weather turns, trust me. Oh, yes, yes. It'll, it'll be quite handy in the wintertime. Yes. Um, Tanya has asked Is it possible to see your photographs anywhere? And 
of course you do have some on your website i know um maybe i can put your that the web address of your website in the chat and yeah. so everybody can see it there that would be wonderful that would be handy um and let's see imogene says brava what a fascinating presentation she says i love how your photos are deep time images and that you see yourself as an archaeologist storyteller scientist which i also appreciate those things thank you imogene um and Elise has said, she comments, the sleds are an unusual design I have not seen before, reminiscent of Norwegian sparks. Do they ice the bottom of the runners and did you see them in use? Okay, um, it's funny that you, you talk about, at least you talk about the bottom of the runners. In the old days, they would actually, and you may know this, Jenny, um, they often took the skins of, let's say, whales or things that had fatty deposits on them and would tie those to the bottom of the runners to help the slide capability of the sledges. So they did used to do that. Um, I did not see any in use because I was not there in the winter. Yeah, and I think nowadays they don't ice them anymore. They, you could see on a lot in your photograph, you could see that they had white runners and that's a high density plastic that is already pretty slippery. Some have metal, there's metal on the bottoms of them. Some, yeah, some have metal too, but yeah, I typically I think, and I could be wrong because I have only been there once in the winter that they don't ice them. But. You're a lucky woman. Yeah, it was fun. I, I got one short dog sled ride, yeah. yeah. Um, this is an anonymous attendee, according to the, the questions, um, who says, Ria, I'm very moved by the depth of your spiritual connection with these environments. Can you say more about how your soul has been affected by what you have experienced in Greenland? I would say the best word that comes to my mind is it's been deepened. My soul has been deepened. And I will I'll add an anecdote to that. Um, there's a it's a very famous, it's not an orphanage, it's a place for troubled kids in Umanak. It's been there for years and years and years. And um, I did some work up there. But the children travel around the world quite a bit to spread Inuit culture. And the first time I felt this connection in the spirit is I met with the children and the people that are with them. They've learned the Inuit drum. Okay which is also a beautiful object, makes a beautiful sound. And they were singing, playing the drum um, in a park outside, um, not for anyone. I was there because I was meeting them. I, and that drum, I've done work just about the drum. I have a, a collection of, of images. And that was the beginning of the gift, the spiritual gift for me. Yes, I believe those children actually have been here as well. Um, they've traveled to, they've done some traveling in the States. Yeah, and it is remarkable. And the drum is yeah, an amazing, an amazing instrument and the singing that goes with it. Um, okay, Susan has asked, how have you funded your work? You mentioned a fellowship, but this, <laughs> with these technical questions. How have, I, how have I funded my work? Okay, my whole life, okay, I have worked. I've had jo a job. I am not an artist full time. I, I mean, I'm, in my, most of my life, I have worked a job and done my art. Okay, so my work, my job work, I'm a book designer, um, has paid for my art. No, no magic there. No, but a lot of a lot of hard work and apparently award winning work. I understand as well when you book design. Yeah. Yes. But and but you also you had a fellowship to Svalbard, is that right? Was, what was no, that? No, not, it's not a paid fellowship. It's a residency. You have to oh, apply. Oh, you have to apply, oh, but they do not give you any money. You have to raise okay. your own money. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's I I know working there. I've any number of times I've had artists ask if they could come with me, and we can't generally afford not only the the associated travel, but with an archaeologist who can't afford the space on the helicopter to get them out there. And it's always frustrating because the National Science Foundation has an artists in residence program for Antarctica. 
Yes, I know. I, but not for the Arctic. No. And I've never really understood that. Why? Something, do something about that, Jenny. Yeah, well, like, uh, well, for whatever sway that I have, I don't know. Um, I'm just also just occurred to me, I'm putting the link directly to your exhibit in the chat so people can find it, hopefully. I'm assuming you can, people can see that there. Um, if not, it's easy enough to find at the museum's webpage, which if you got an invitation to this event, you know how to find the, the webpage. Um, at the moment, it looks like that's all the questions. Um, I just, I wanna say again, how much, how grateful we are to have this exhibit here in the museum. It's really, um, even, though, even though it's virtual, um, it's, it's really lovely the, the, uh, the, the intersection of art and science and spirituality even, and, and people who are present in a sense by their absence, I think it's something that uh, really is is wonderful, and it's. Uh, I hope I hope we can see more photographs. I, one day we'll be able to go back to reinvent and yeah, look at those things again. Thank you. Just, thank you so much to you and Susan and to the museum. It's, it's wonderful what you're doing. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I just one other question occurred to me just now because you talk about working on the edges and appreciation for old rocks. Have you traveled to Newfoundland and Labrador? No, I would love to go, and I would love to go to Ellesmere Island or yes. Baffin Island. Yes, but it, it's it's actually easier to go to Greenland. It is, a, yes, yeah, and which is very makes me very sad. So yes. one day maybe go. One day, yeah, I'll drive at least to. Labrador. Yeah, yeah, Labrador is not to Labrador, yeah, a long way, but you can get there. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well. Thank you very, very much. And to our audience, thank you for coming. And I hope you enjoy the exhibit. It will be up, well, indefinitely, really. And as we said, that's a wonderful and virtual exhibit, so we don't have to take them down. Um, and the recording of this presentation will be available in, we expect, a week or two on our webpage. So, and it will be on the same page where you can find the exhibit, so it'll be easy to find. Okay. Thanks again, Guyana. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.